It's the Billy Graham Boxing Podcast, The Preacher's Sermons. Right, so welcome to Billy's Conservatory, this time for episode two of the Billy Graham Boxing Podcast. Uh, I'm John Evans and this is Billy Graham. How are you, Billy? I'm fine, thanks. Good. I think uh, the first thing we've got to do, we've got to thank the fans for getting behind this, you know, be really, people seem to enjoy it, we've had loads of questions and good comments and it seems to be what people want to hear. Well, you know, the thing is that that, that makes me feel good, that's, that, that's why I'm doing it, to be honest with you. Yeah. I'm doing it because, like I say, the fans treated me great when I was a trainer, um, so yeah, I like to talk to them. Good. And you can get your questions in, uh, preacherspod at gmail.com, uh, we're on Twitter, lots of you are getting in touch on Twitter, at preacherspod. And write, review, and subscribe to a podcast. I believe I've got to say that. I don't know how these things work, but I think that's how we get more popular. Finally, Billy, it's February since the last shows in Britain. Um, top rank have been putting on shows in America for a few weeks. We finally get some British title action this week. Brad Foster's fighting, but it's going to be taking place in TV studios with no fans there. I, how do you think that's going to affect things? Wow, well, I, I, I really don't know. I mean. I've sort of, I, I had a fight in, I, had, I fought a guy in, in my gym once in some championships years ago when I was a kid and that, um, and that was a strange thing, there was no fans and that just looked like, um, you know, my gym mates was there and stuff like that. And yeah. um, I fought a guy called Russ Shaw from Oldham and um, he was a good amateur and that. I, what I can remember that is we hardly threw a punch, we hardly threw a punch at each other. You know what I mean? Um, so I don't know how that, I don't know how that's going to work. And um, also, what I'm thinking about this fight behind closed doors, and no crowd, is um, reminds me of back in the back in the day um, when the World Sporting Club in London and that, and some sporting clubs all over the country, you wasn't allowed to shout and cheer. I think it's because um, the sadistic bastards wanted to hear the punches landed and that, you know, and um, it, 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 so. There's going to be a lot of that. It's going to, it's going to be um, pretty raw. It's going to be a completely new experience, isn't it? You know, yeah. these fights coming all the time, the microphone's going to amplify everything. Later on in these series of Behind Closed Doors, we're going to get Dillian White against Alexander Povetkin. That's going to be brutal with no crowd. That is going to sound, that is going to sound, well, to be honest with you, it might, I'm curious to find out people's reaction to that when they actually, because they'll actually be able to hear what's going on. Yeah. The noises are there. You only have to be leaning over the ropes for sparring to hear the noises, but a, a meaningful fight like that's that right. between two elite heavyweights, that's going to be raw. And yeah. can you imagine we're going to get to hear the corner work? You know, how would you have. Can you imagine Sky Sports in your day, Billy, being able to hear every single word you say to your fighters? Well, when my fights used to get repeated the day after, that was. Um, it was just all in my, in my corner. It was just bleep, 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 bleep. <laughs> That's the reality of what it's like. You're in a drastic situation, so you're not speaking the Queen's English. Yeah, it's going to be um, interesting to see how the fighters react as well. You know, these days during fight week, one day they're doing an open workout, which I think most of the fighters secretly hate. I don't know if, if you used to. Uh, I, I used to. I used to do a thing um, on the body belt, Ricky Hatton in um, the Arndale Centre, yeah. and that. Um, I used to hate it. Yeah, I believe I most of the it. fighters hate that because we're trying to but make got, the weight but, and Yeah, stuff. but you, you've got but to you do it. To do it. The things what you have to do to publicise the fights. Yeah. You've got to publicise the fight. You've got to help the promoters. You've got to help the promoters. So they're just things what you've got to do. But do. Um, no, none of us liked it. But all these things break up fight week. You know, you've got the public workout. You've got the press conference. You've got God knows how many interviews. Yeah. And they all take the mind off the fight. Whereas it's, this time, it's just going to be reduced down to... You're fighting this guy on Saturday night in that room. The dressing rooms are going to be quiet. They're not going to have a big team of people supporting them. No big ring walk. It's just the bare bones of a fight. And it'll be interesting to see how some guys adapt to that. It will be. I mean, I'm, I, 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 don't, I, I don't know any more than anybody yeah. about this because it, it's, it's new to me. Um, I, actually, I, I mean, I, I, I really didn't like the idea whatsoever. I just thought it can't work, but now... I'm getting really curious yeah. to see how it will happen. And, and, and to be honest with you, I do like to hear the sounds and the noises and the, because I can judge the fight better. Because yeah. don't forget, I'm used to having my head inside the canvas anyway. Yeah. So I, I can hear and what's going on. So 
I might, pro I pro I might enjoy it, but I don't know. You know, every now and then I've got a shoe on a question in out of blue because it reminds me of a story. You just mentioned you're boxing in the amateur championships against your mate mm. in the gym. You've got to tell the people about your first ever amateur fight, Billy, but what you and your mate Piggy got up to the night before your first ever amateur fight. Oh, about the tattoos. Yeah, that was um, back in them days, um, like in the early 70s, like, um, you know, people with tattoos was quite frowned upon. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so I was quite uh, self-conscious it was going to be my first amateur fight. So I was quite self-conscious about the tattoos. Obviously not now. Um, so me, Piggy, my mate Billy Lee, um, I used to live with their family actually. Um, his dad was a painter and decorator and um, we decided that um, he was going to paint the arms, paint over the tattoos. So he's mixing all the paints, trying to get to the skin colour and all that, like, you know what I mean? And um, so, he paint, so then he painted my arms in the kitchen. I was fighting in Colliers the day after, like, you know, one of Brian Hughes' guys. And um, I painted my arms. Well, he painted my arms. And, um, but I forgot to fucking shave them. Do you know what I mean? And I had all these tears all matted in me. And I said, I can't do what, this. And what type of paint did he use? Gloss. <laughs> yeah, it was fucking gloss. So I said, you better get it off. You better get it off. So obviously, his dad was a painting decorator, so he had turpentine and that, you know what I mean? So he's rubbing my hands and all that. My arms was fucking, my arms was fucking red raw. They were still red raw the night of the fight. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so, yeah. So there you go. Every now and then, I have to shoe home one of those in because otherwise we'd just pass by. But gloss paint, I, I, of course, what other solution would you ever come up with? Oh, well. <laughs> there, there is fights being made or being talked about and Canelo, the biggest time of sport, you, I know you love Canelo. Yeah. Um, Rumours about who he's going to fight. Billy Joe Saunders has said he's not going to be ready for September. He's not willing to take a pay cut. Um, so he's ruled himself out. And it seems like Callum Smith's the front runner for that fight. So Callum Smith to fight Canelo? Yeah. I would love to see Callum Smith fight Canelo. I'd love to see Billy Joe Saunders fight Canelo. Um, I think Billy Joe Saunders would give Canelo fits. I think Canelo's a great, a great fighter. He's going to be, go down as an all-time great Hall of Famer. You know what I mean? Obviously, um, but I'd like to see him fight Billy Joe Saunders because I think Billy Joe Saunders would give him fits. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's a big opportunity to turn down for Billy, that isn't it? Especially when he's got like eight weeks notice. Well, it depends what shape he's in now. I mean, um, back in the day, like the Champs Camp guys, um, Carl, Ensley and the, the rest of the guys and that, um, we just used to work out all, all the time, yeah. you know. There's only certain fighters like Ricky Hatton, maybe Steve Foster, in between fights that did go on ballooning weight. And, but, but most of the time, the fighters, was, we just worked like a day, like a, having a day job yeah. every day. We just trained every day. So when I got a, if I got notice for the title fight, um, I'd only need six weeks. That's all I'd need. Yeah. But I can't speak for Billy Joe. Um, you don't take fights when you're not ready. Um, I'd prefer to pull my fighters out of fight. I don't, don't care what the money is, whatever. You've got to be right, you've got to prepare yourself. So if Billy Joe has turned the fight down... It's got to be a good reason. There's got to be a good reason. I think so. He's obviously... Well, we all know what Billy Joe's like. And so I think he's um, probably put a lot of weight on. And, um, you know, so if he says, if he says he's not, he can't get ready in eight weeks' time, I believe him. Because I don't think Billy Joe Saunders is scared of anybody. No, I, I don't either. We'll talk about, there's no point in talking about fights that are just in the air at the minute. So if Callum Smith and Canelo does get announced, I know you'll like I'd to talk to about that. that. So we'll talk about I that. love Callum Smith yeah, and I love Canelo. Big dangerous guy. So we'll talk about that more if, if and when it happens. Um, last bit of news before we, we move on to Billy's memories. Um, Roberto Duran, Billy, went into hospital with coronavirus, but it, it was never going to beat him, was it? The old hands of stone. Coronavirus is never going to beat Roberto Duran. Yeah. I don't think anything can beat Roberto Duran. He's as tough as nails. And I, he's one of my favourite all-time fighters. And he is actually Ricky Hatton's favourite all-time fighter. Yeah, he is. I've bumped into each other a few times. Probably been out on the town a few times as well together, haven't they? Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, we'll be talking a little bit more about Ricky in uh, part two. Last week it was the animals. This week it's Ricky Hatton. And that's in part two. 
Right, you know, part two of these podcasts, we're going to go back over Billy's memories, some funny old stories. Uh, last week we had the animals. Um, when we asked for questions, lots of people got in touch with Ricky Hatton. And me and Billy spoke and we decided that rather than just jumping in and out with questions about Ricky, it's such a big story, we're going to break this down into little sections of Ricky's career and we'll drop these in throughout the podcasts. So I want to start with the first time you actually laid eyes on him, Billy. You know, this wasn't the cliches old story of some unknown kid knocking on the gym door and him becoming and being obviously a world-class talent, was it? You had phone calls about Ricky coming seeing you before you actually met him. Yeah, by the time I met Ricky Hatton, like I say, I'd, um, we'd won every title you could get, um, every title that was available. Uh, the British, th there was no English title then, but um, we've got World, European, um, Commonwealth, British, Lonsdale Belt, outright winners, um, everything. You, you know, uh, when Ricky come to my gym, um, I know I kept getting phone calls of various people. So I just I don't know who they was. I think maybe Matt would be his dad or Paul Dunn, his ex trainer, his, his amateur trainer. I can't remember who they was to be honest with you. But I keep getting these phone calls. Can Ricky Atten come down to your gym and have a workout? So I'd go, yeah, of course he can. You know, who the fuck's Ricky Atten? Do you know what I mean? And um, I'd get, I'd, I was getting different reports because um, everybody used to come in my gym, um, people who was big fans of the amateur boxing and that. So some of the people would tell me he's a good, strong kid. He's, he was a junior then. He was only a junior before he went to the World Championships. Yeah, it's like 16 years old, this, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. I know it was before he went to the World Juniors anyway. And um, I'd get different reports. Some would, some would say he's just a strong kid um, with a good left up to the body. Because he was knocking everybody out, do you know what I mean? Um, so some people was telling me that, that he's just a strong kid and once he, become, once he gets to the seniors, it'll be a different ball game, you know what I mean? Um, then other people was telling me that he was fantastic, yeah. do you know what I mean? Because he was knocking everybody out. But I'd never seen him. This went on for, this went on for weeks, you know what I mean? I'd, so anyway, then, then I finally got a phone call and they said, well, could he come down tomorrow? I went, yeah. I said, you know, of course. So... What was you expecting then, based on the stories you'd heard? I didn't, I didn't know. I, I, knew, I knew a lot about that there was kids who was in the juniors, kids who mature, very young, you know, they, some of them are shaving at fucking 15 and yeah. that, you know what I mean? So I, I was expecting that, to be honest with you, a strong kid and just... He was, mature for his age and that. That's probably what I was expecting. Um, so what did you think when little Ricky with it, the pudding ball haircut he had at the time? What, or did he have the spiky haircut at the time? No, he had that. He looked like this fucker out of Clopper Castle. Um, or, you know, looked like the, the first, someone like the first Black Adder or something like that, you know what I mean? Um, first impressions, well, he looked like a little boy. Do you know what I mean? Um, but... He, he had a pushed in nose and that, you know what I mean? Yeah. So um, I thought, he takes a bit of stick, you know what I mean? Um, and he looks very strong and that. I knew he was too heavy anyway. He was fighting at welterweight yeah. then, do you know what I mean? So I sneaked a glimpse, I sneaked a glimpse. It took, he was on, was on our own before the other guys had arrived. So I sneaked a glimpse of him in the changing rooms to look at him naked to see what his body looked like, you know what I mean? And I remember he had a really powerful back and really powerful footballer's legs, you know, thighs, his thighs yeah. was really muscular and powerful. So he looked really strong, do you know what I mean? So, and because he had like a um, boxer's nose, I thought he's just going to be a strong kid, you know what I mean? But um, how wrong I was. How wrong you were. So you, you, uh, you had that hour with him before the other lads got in the gym. I took him on the pads. Took him on the pads. Was it instant? Did you real? Did you click together? Did you like his personality? Did you realise this is going to be this kid's got something? Was it as quick as a flash? He was kind of he was kind of, he, he was kind of um, quite shy at first to me, you know, with me, you know what I mean, meeting me. I took him on the pads. I realised I realised he was very strong. But um, obviously, I, I had the good left left hookers. You know what I mean? I, the, the people I had in the gym. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, but I was very impressed with him when I took him on the pads. Um, but I think maybe it was the second time he come down. I was really impressed. For, 
No, it was the first day. I remember going home and saying to Iona, this kid has just walked into the gym today. He's, he's, he's unbelievable. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was the first day. Literally that quick. How long yeah. did it take you to? I, I think maybe I think maybe I let him spar the first day. I can't remember now. I knew immediately, and I told him straight, just as you are the best sixteen-year-old kid I have ever seen. Yeah. Now you said the situation he was walking into there. This wasn't just an unknown gym with unknown fighters and Miss Star appeared. You had world champion people who'd done it all, and yeah. it was a type of gym where. Ricky had to earn his respect, you know, uh, the, the figures who were in there, just talk through well, some of the names he was mixing well, I, with. Well, the thing, the thing was, what, the thing why I could judge him so well was because I had some of the best like well weights in the country. Yeah. I had Andy Holligan, who just won the British title back. Um, great fighter. Um, good guy and all. I had Paul Burke, who was the Commonwealth like well weight champion at the time, yeah. former British lightweight champion. I had a um, great prospect with Mark Haslam, yeah. Um, at Light Welter, Chris Barnett at Light Welter. Good fighter. Great, great talent. Um, Nicky Boyd, ferocious right hand puncher at Light Welter. Um, so I had some of the best Light Welter weights in the country, or yeah. the best Light Welter. So you had a measuring stick straight away. So I, so I could judge him. I could judge him. And um, he's, uh, he'd spar with these guys and that. And I, he should not have been able to do what he could do yeah. with these guys. I'm not saying he would have beat all them at that time, do you know what I mean? But over the first few rounds, he'd stand at any one of them on the head. And it wasn't his strength what impressed me. I had bigger punches in the gym. Andy Oligan was a bigger puncher than Ricky, do you know what I mean? Um, no, it was his skill what impressed me. How long did it take you to realise that you could... Because you can have someone in the gym who's got all the talent in the world, but if you don't enjoy working with them... It, it, it's not going to click, is it? How long did it take you to realise that, as well as having all the physical skills, he was also someone you were going to get along with well and have the time of your life, as it turned out? Oh, well, once, 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 it, because Ricky Hatton isn't shy. Yeah. So once he, beco once he become not shy with me, because he, you know, once he, once he knew that I was just a rough-ass fucker from Salford, do you know yeah. what I mean? We just hit it off right away. He was, um, there's a lot of fighters I enjoyed working with, do you yeah. know what I mean? Um... Ricky was so much fun to work with. He was the best student I've ever had. Yeah. Um, working with Ricky, I used to look forward. I used, I used to look forward to going to work anyway, you know what I mean? I like being in the ring with fighters on the pads. That's what I like. That's what I enjoy, and talking. That's how you learn to fight, by talking. By talking and being in the ring with them, you know what I mean? And um, he was just made for me. Um, I told him, I told him, when I first met him, listen, you could go to any gym in the world and anybody would want you. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I said, you could go to America, the Americans will love you. Um, you, could, you could pick any trainer you wanted in the world and they would want to train you. Because I wanted him to, I, I only wanted him to be with me if it's me we picked. Do you know what I mean? Um, but I knew from, very, from right from the off, and I told him straight right from the off, You'll be, you can be world champion. You know he, I mean? he shared this attitude as well, didn't he? You, you know, you've, yeah. you've told the story. You used to sit on the steps for, for hours after training, talking yeah. to each other about what you could do. It wasn't just you boosting him up to, no. to encourage him. Ricky had the, had had, the same determination and ambition as you. He had loads of self belief, um, but it, it's not honestly. It's not made up. I did say, you'll be in Las Vegas. You'll be in Madison Square Garden. Everybody's going to do over you'll be the world champion. Yeah. I told him that right from the first week. Do you know what I mean? Because he, he, did, he probably come all that week. I can't remember. Do you know what I mean? But um, I, I knew how good he was going to be. Yeah. He knew how good he was going to be as well. Now, the, the style that he eventually adopted, you know, the, the famous stepping around, picking shots to the body, pit of the stomach, mm. around to the liver, mm. uh, switching the angles all the time and marauding in off a jab. And w Was that a style that you'd wanted one of your fighters to develop for a while. You had Holligan, who was a, a good fighter, a good puncher. I wish I'd have had Andy Holligan when he was younger. You had Mark Aslam, who was an aggressive, muscular, ten-stone yeah. guy. Was this a style you'd, you'd wanted to perfect for a while, or was it something that Ricky just came with and you, you were able to work no, with? No, it was something what I'd been working on for a while. 
when I when I was when I was a young kid, when I was a boxing fan, most of my the, my favourite fighters, what I liked was um the guy, the guys who could box. Yeah. You know, the classical boxers, you know what I mean? I like boxer punches a lot, I mean a little bump to sugar rays and all that lot obviously, you know what I mean? Um I love I'm a huge fan of Muhammad Ali. I used to like my preference them days, uh, before when I was younger, was um, I used to like um, classical boxers who could tame the strong guy. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And then eventually stop him, but they could tame him. You know what I mean? And I used to like to fight fight pressure fighters myself. I used to like people to come to me. Um, but over the years, my tastes kind of changed. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I preferred what what my favourite fighters are is um, aggressive counter punches. I think it's the safest way to fight. It looks dangerous, but it's the safest way to fight. Um, my, Jose Naples was the master at it. Um, I was also a huge fan of Mike Tyson. Me and Ricky was both my, fans of Mike Tyson and that. We both liked a lot of the same fighters. But by that time, it wasn't really a choice. Um, I think them, the kind of aggressive fighters, I think they picked me. Do you know what I mean? I yeah. think they, they, they knew I liked that, I, I liked that style. And um, so I think they basically picked me. So Ricky boxes amateur for a year, another year, 18 months or so, goes into the seniors and eventually turns pro. You say you spent almost every day of your life together, but in a very early career, Billy, you know, he, he disappears off to Madison Square Garden for his second ever fight and you're not there on the plane with him. I was proper pissed off about that, but I had a, I had a, I had a big fight. Who was it? Yeah. Now? Who, who These are the days when um, Frank Warren was putting on shows with Nassim Ahmed in America, and Nas had the famous fight with Kevin Kelly at Madison Square Garden. Yeah. Ricky got a spot on the undercard. But you were over that? in Zambia, weren't you? Was with it Paul Burke? Is that when it was? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, of course I was in. Yeah, I was in. Yeah, Paul, he had um, a Commonwealth title fight. Um, well, that's that's um, that's a story in itself. That's isn't it? a story in itself. Yeah, the guy died after the fight. Um, we was underdogs, me and Paul. Paul was coming to the end as well, so there's no way I could not be with. There's no way I could not be with Paul. Yeah. And it did turn out tragically in the end. Um, so maybe I shouldn't have gone. Um, but I, no, I was fuming about him going to Madison Square Garden his second pro fight with that. How me. did he get around this though? The little fucker conned me. <laughs> he knew how to charm me. Do you know what I mean? He went, he come up to me and went, listen, Bill, I'll do whatever you say. If you don't want me to go to Madison Square Garden, I won't argue with you. I won't moan, I won't fucking say any problem, you know, I won't, yeah. give, you no, won't give you any shit and all that shit. He went, but I'd really like to go. <laughs> 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 so, what could you do? But, oh. I, what, what was that like? Because you jetted back from Zambia, you, I believe you had a fight on the, the same night Ricky was fighting in I, Madison Square Garden, you, know, you were you got, at York Hall, you got to, you got to understand, i just been in this tragic situation in Zambia, the guy's on a life support machine, the doctors have told me that he's certainly going to die, and I couldn't even go home. I had to fly for, straight from Zambia to London for Eddie Bingham having a um, fight in Thurbin, was yeah. it? Was that the first fight or the second fight? It was the first fight, wasn't first, it? Yeah, first yeah, it was the first was fight. Yeah. Um, so, you know, my head was all over the place, you know what I mean? And on the same night, Ricky Atten's fighting this guy. So I get a phone call about the opponent. Um, oh, I, ph I phoned him up about the opponent. And he's fighting a guy who was seven pound heavier than him. Seven, seven pound heavier than him, I think, at yeah. the time. And um, so I was, I was going mad. I was going mad then, you know what I mean? So. God, that was an exit. That who, was an, who, an exit How did you time. find out? You, oh, yeah, I assume, would, would Ricky have been shown on the pay-per-view that night or did you get a phone call off someone like Ernie Fossey or Ricky himself? I Can phone, you remember how you found out about the result? I, no, I, I don't. I can't remember. I just remember I was, I was sat with Chris Sanagar because he must have had a fight on the bill. I was sat with Chris Sanagar and I phoned, so I phoned Frank's network, like, you know, net, um, Who's the opponent and all that lot? And then when I found out he was seven pound heavy or five pound heavy or something like that, I was fuming. Yeah. So I've got one guy, one guy dying in Zambia. I've got the Nicky Thurbin fight with with, with Enzo Bingham, 
and I've got the worry about Ricky Hatton fighting in Madison Square Garden. So, Jesus, <laughs> that was pretty, that was a rough night. <laughs> but he, he he went on a bit of a tear, Ricky, early, didn't he? No stoppages. Had a run of first round knockouts. The left up to the body was coming. But he boxed some good kids early on, didn't he? As well, you know, he wasn't mollycoddled. You, Guys with journeyman's record, but solid guys, former ABA champions. I think he boxed. I think he boxed two ABA champions in his in his first, in his first um, amateur fight. You know what used to make me laugh about Ricky Hatton? He'd get, you'd get, um, we'd get an opponent. You know what I mean? Obviously, it's obviously he fought some journeyman as well. Do you yeah. know what I mean? So we'd get the opponent, and he'd look at his record. He'd go, he'd be really pissed off. He'd go. He's lost them. He's lost this. He's lost that. He was he was really pissed off. He, he wanted to fight everybody. He wanted to fight everybody. You know what? Normally, when you're a kid, you turn pro and you're young, especially someone as young as him. You're glad when you see the record and you know that they've lost a load of fights. Well, you, you he didn't. You knew he, you had a duel as well. You knew how good he was. Yeah. Did you used to get a little bit? Frustrated at having to fight these guys. Did you want to let him off the leash, or did you want him to make no, the most of these early fights? I wanted. Him to, I wanted to make the most of it. I wanted to make the most of it. I should say to him, "Listen, you're going to be. Listen, you're going to be fighting all kinds of people. Stop fucking moaning." <laughs> you know. But he, if he'd seen the guy with it, he had a losing record. He'd sort of. He'd be like, you know, de deflated. Yeah. We was always brewing up in the gym. We was always making tea because he likes tea like me. But always brewing up in the gym, talking and all that, you know, and. Um, yeah, if the guy had a losing record and that, he'd be proper pissed off. And I went, you won't be complaining in a few years to come. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? You'll know what it's really like in, in years to come. So I was glad. But I knew I knew I could move him quickly. Yeah. I knew I could move him quickly. But it sounds, Billy, like you were quite happy to take your time. You, the mm. best days of your life, you said, aren't you? You know, the big nights came and I knew the, the nights with Zoo came, but these were your favourite times, weren't they? Yeah. They, they, they was, they, the, the, the coming up times was yeah. my, my favourite time. I used to look forward to going to work. We'd be in the ring all the time together, me and Ricky, all the time, yeah. working on stuff. Um, he was dead eager to learn. He never got frustrated. He never got pissed off if he couldn't do something right away. Do you know what I mean? He had patience, and I've got patience. I, I have, I'm not a patient person. But when boxing is concerned, I have, I have got patience. I, I find that strange, strange myself because yeah. I'm not a patient person. But um, it was so good working with him. Like, you, you, you kind of, I used to look forward to going to work and think about him. He was constantly on my mind. What we could do, what, what, try this, try this, try that. You know what I mean? Yeah. And it was, wow, it was unbelievable. Went on this tear. And, and, I, and I'm used to working with good fighters, don't forget. Yeah, I'm yeah. used to working with good fighters. But something but, about this just triggered that excitement. Oh, yeah, it was um, it, it was like a dream come true for me. 18 months, you said before, the only title you'd not won at that point as a trainer, area title. <sighs> yeah. English title didn't exist. You'd never had an area champion then. No. All of a sudden, Ricky gets presented with uh, the chance to win it, doesn't he? His first title. Your final title, you know, complete the full set, and he gets Tommy Pe a fight with a guy called Tommy Peacock, and that's what really marked him as one to watch from people watching on TV, and really set him on the trail. Then, wasn't it? Right. Well, I'll tell you that 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 that, that come at a per that come at a perfect time. Um, I wanted him to get first seven rounder anyway. I knew Tommy Peacock anyway. Yeah. Because he'd beaten a guy of mine called Mark Haslam. He was a great prospect. Um, so I knew, I knew how good Tommy Peacock was, and Tommy Peacock was a good amateur. He was unbeaten as well. And to be honest with you, like Ricky's not was never an arrogant person and was always polite with everybody, but he didn't like Tommy Peacock. Because every time he bumps into Tommy Peacock, Tommy Peacock could say, who did you fight, who are you fighting? And every, and every time he, yeah. he'd see who he was fighting, Tommy Peacock could disrespect him and say, oh, he's a fucking mug and all that, like, you know what I mean? So Ricky used to say to me, I fucking hate that Tommy Peacock, you know what I mean? Um, good so boxer though, Tommy. Tommy was a very good boxer. And he, and he, he hey, listen, and if you, if you watch the fight, he come there to win. Yeah, he was undefeated at the time. Undefeated at the time. And Tommy Peacock come there to win, you know what I mean? And he really had a go. But um, Ricky was mad for fighting Tommy Peacock. Yeah. So it was the perfect fight at the perfect time. Ricky actually had a great apprenticeship, to be honest with you. Yeah. He really did have a great apprenticeship. 
I, I would vividly remember what it was at Oldham Sports Centre, what, five minute drive mm. from where you live now, Billy. Mm. And um, that was a night it got rolling, wasn't it? You know, people started taking notice of this exciting guy who oh, had a well, style. You, there wasn't well, any British fighters who fought like Ricky well, at that you, time. Well, look, Sky all you got, Sports on a Saturday night. All you got to do is watch that finish. It, that, it was a work of art. You, you can remember I mean? it picture perfect uh, now, pi can you? Picture, picture perfect. And the thing is, it's like everything we'd been working on. Yeah. in the gym. Go on, describe it. The way he shifted round. We, yeah. we was working on him shifting around and, and I always want the middle. I always want the middle. The pit of the stomach. The pit of the stomach. Well, they, they call it the solar plexus, but it's actually his stomach. Yeah, there's this, there's, there's this thought that people have in their mind as Ricky the body puncher is leaning over to his left and digging that left hook into the liver. But the one that did the damage was sweeping around and putting the left to a pit yeah, of stomach, the stomach, Yeah, the other stuff is the disguise to get that. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? That's the prize. I used to try and work, yeah, that's the prize. I used to try and work on that with, with, with army fighters and that, you know what I mean? But um, he was the one who, he was the one who could, he was made for it, you know what I mean? Ricky Hatton, when Ricky Hatton was at his peak, he was the best pound for pound body puncher in the world. Yeah. The, the variety, do you know what I mean? And plus the punches was getting harder as he as he matured and stuff, you know. But but that night, that's when he um, that's when he come of age. We fought Tommy Peacock because yeah. Tommy Peacock was a good fighter, trust me. Um, and he gave it his all as well, Tommy Peacock. Do you know what I mean? And he absolutely took him apart, but he took him apart in a beautiful way. And um, I think that's when. I think that's when. The boxing fans, and the the reporters and. You know the TV and that. I think that's when they knew that they this, knew what you knew. This, yeah, they knew what I knew. This so kid is this kid is special. They were all in on the. But he had a long way to go then, and he improved massively yeah. over the years. But um, that was a great night. Yeah. Over the, the coming months, we'll we'll keep splitting Ricky's career up into bits and pieces like that. We'll take you, we'll take you in the gyms, we'll take you in the dressing rooms, we'll take you in the ring. We'll we'll let you know what went on and. Uh, but we'll keep breaking it up. We don't just want to run through it in one go, do we? It's, it's too big a story to, to just run off. So we'll keep breaking Ricky's career up into uh, little sections like that. Okay, uh, we said in week one that we wanted your questions to come in for this final part and Billy will answer anything that you sent in. You had, you had second thoughts about that, didn't you? As long as it's boxing it? related. Yeah. As long as it's boxing related, I will answer any question. Boxing related, that's the, uh, that's right. that's the qualifier, isn't it? Uh, and we had a lot. We had a lot, a lot of emails and a lot of people on Twitter at Preachers Pod getting in touch. Uh, we picked five or six of them out. See if yours is included. So first one up is from a guy called I'm Spartacus Billy, who's on one of the boxing websites, and he says, um, "Whenever he, this guy saw an interview with you back in the day, he always got a sense that you were proud of the Manchester boxing scene, and he viewed it in a different light to the rest of the country." Could he say he felt the Manchester scene was different and did he feel that overall they had better trainers and fighters there? Well, obviously better fighters, that's for sure. Um, and they, I think it was, it was mostly me and Brian Hughes who was, train, who was training the fighters. And um, it's not, look, it's no secret, Manchester, Manchester boxing turned into, oh, and obviously Champs Camp, forgot about yeah. Champs Camp, you know, Phil Martin started it. Brian Hughes was always a successful trainer. There was Phil Martin, and then then there was me. Yeah. Um, so I think well, I played a pretty big part in the Manchester boxing scene, but the Manchester boxing scene just just became on come on fire. I, I told you the main ones who attracted the people um, was Michael Gomez, uh, Anthony Farrell, and Ricky Hatton. But uh, there was a lot of great fighters in Manchester at that time. Yeah, Robin Reed, some of the names. And Robin Reed was training in Manchester. He wasn't actually from Manchester, but he was training in Manchester. Pat Barrett, do you know what I mean? They, they was... It's endless, isn't it? Carl Thompson, yeah. Ainsley Bingham. Yeah. And, Frank and it, Grant a little bit before. F yeah, all, all, all that stuff. And, and look, Manchester went from being not a boxing town. There's always decent fights from Manchester, always, you know what I mean? But, but it went from not being a boxing town to be in a massive boxing town. And it was talked about as being like um, the boxing capital. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And it, it actually was. It was always London and that, you know what I mean? Um, but no, Manchester definitely took over. 
But uh, so obviously the trees played a part, and but I really can't explain it to be honest with you. But yeah, I was um, really proud to be a part of that, and um, I'm proud to come from Manchester. Well, I come from Salford actually, but it's great in Manchester, you know. Yeah. And um, so there was that painting, wasn't there? Remember a painting we got you, uh, the guy artist he's called Jay Connolly does some really good paintings I the and painting. he did the painting didn't he of all mm. the, the famous faces from the Manchester boxing scene yeah that just shows how how thriving it Ma was at one point it was Manchester it used to be London where the, it used to be London where there was a the place to be if you wanted to be a fighter but it definitely without a shadow of doubt became if you wanted to be a fighter to come to Manchester yeah right next question uh Darren Rees, who helps us out with the ed podcast editing, so we thought we'd best uh, throw his question in. He said, what's the biggest thing that trainers and fighters miss out on in the gym these days? What do you think we should focus on a lot more? Footwork, reactions, feints, mental game. What, what do you think is the overlooked quality these days? Well, I think, that they, I think they've always been an overlooked quality. Um, they're, they're, they're the essential ingredients what, what make a great, well-balanced fighter. Um, Balance, distance, timing, um, anticipation. I think you're born with anticipation, um, but all them things are extre extremely important. But I think what the I think what um, what the wrong thing is what everybody's concentrating t t too much on how much weight they can lose, what weight they can get down to. Yeah. Um, they're playing a really dangerous game. Because um, most of them don't know what they're fucking talking about. Anyway, you can make any weight. You can make any weight what you like. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's a way to make any weight what you like, what you like. But you've got to be able to perform at that weight. I think the most damaging thing in boxing today, the most dangerous thing in boxing today, is people are fighting below their natural weights. So, um, yeah, they got to concentrate on all them things to improve you as a fighter. But I think what they want to take more notice of is stop fucking killing yourself to make weight. It's not a, it's not a weight making challenge to see you can get down to the, the lightest weight you can be. Yeah. It's fucking dangerous and it's, well, it's gonna cause more deaths. Yeah, we'll definitely do go into that in more depth. I think that's your pet topic, isn't it, Billy? Yeah, it is. For weights. But you, I'll tell you what, just before we move on, people will say, well, how can he talk? Look at what Ricky used to get up to and boil himself down. But Ricky wasn't getting himself down to an unnaturally low weight, was Ricky, he? He Ricky, probably used to go up Ricky, unnaturally high. Ricky was Ricky was losing body fat. Yeah. Body fat, what his body didn't want. Natural weight, what his body didn't want. He wasn't taking himself down to an unnatural weight. Yeah. So that's totally different. And plus, I had the best nutritionist in the business, who really knew, he really knew his stuff. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, I always, I and I always knew. There's always a bridge too far. You can make any way what we what want, but your body's got an optimum fighting weight, and Ricky fought at his fighting weight. He did. Uh, we did say we won't go into Ricky Atten questions, but this one touches on Ricky, but it's something you did for years and years. Uh, it only seems to be the clips of you doing it with Ricky that, that get the attention. But a uh, question from Peter Morrison. He said, he wonders what it, if you'd tell us what it's really like to put on the body belt and those mitts and roll with the punches of Ricky Hatton when he was in monastery mode. What toll did it take on your body? What were some of the injuries you suffered? And do you think there's anything you could have done to preserve yourself in order to be as fit as you could at that stage? Look. But you used to do this with every all your fighters, from cruiserweights right down to lightweights. Heavyweights as well. Heavyweights. Um, look. Yeah, it did cause me massive damages, and I'm certainly paying for it today. Um, but... What you've got to understand is, I mean, Frank one on one said to me, Billy, why do you do it? I, I actually enjoyed it. I loved it. And I said to Frank, I said, it's because it's the closest thing I can get to fighting. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? I actually enjoyed it. I used to love it. Um, I used to love being in the ring messing. It's why I could, I could gauge the stamina. I, I, I knew I could gauge everything because I was involved and I was doing it. I was moving around and that, you know what I mean, and making them work to exhaustion and that. I, I used to actually love it. You could I, you could tell what they weighed to within half a pound. You told me once. I, I could tell what they I could tell what they was weighing. I, each individual fight, I'd know. I could tell what they, they weighed. I know how to I know I know how to bring them to a peak, 
because they was doing it with me, so I could feel it. So I needed that as much as they needed that. That's one of the things that made me good, right? Do you know what I mean? Um, because I used to do that. Towards the end, the last few years, um, I didn't like it then. It was too much then because the injuries were too bad. What, list off some of the things. I know your hands are so bad now, aren't they? Just I've list got, off some of the... I've got multiple... I, I had my hands x-rayed a couple of years ago. I've got multiple fractures in my hands, both hands, um, but they've all healed wrongly. Well, bones are touching together and that, you know. I've obviously got arthritis in my hands. Um, but it's not, ju it's, not, it's not just your hands. I mean, the reason why that body belt got so thick, because it wasn't like that in the first place, was because I had two hernias, you know. But, you know, spending a lot of time on a boxing ring, obviously your knees, your hips, you know. Yeah, but it was all worth it at the time. It was all part... None of your lads would... Oh, do, do, you, do you think your lads wouldn't have reached the levels you did if you hadn't done that? No. De definitely, I don't yeah. think they would have. I, don't, I, don't, I, think, I, think that, I think that's what gave me the edge against other coaches because I knew what my, my guy had in the tank because... I'd actually felt it with them. Yeah. So I knew what they had in the tank. And towards the end, they used to have the Novocaine injections to just kill the pain. But it didn't stop doing the damage. But, um, you know, look, let's face it, you can work on a building site. Yeah. And end up with arthritis and injuries. And that's just by working out on a building site. You yeah. know what I mean? And, um, and I got a lot more money than working on a building site. <laughs> <laughs> Something that pisses you off a bit as well is the clips we show. Are you at the end, aren't they? Yeah, I can't in the stand early it. days, it was yeah. it was almost like a fight, wasn't it? You used to yeah. be throwing shots back and I wish, yeah, I wish they I wish they'd stop showing that old stuff when I was a fucking old man. I wish they'd show some of the stuff what Sky have obviously got when I was a young man. Well, not even young. Um, my forties or something. Yeah. And I wish they'd I wish they'd start showing that instead of showing this shit when I'm old and past it. <laughs> uh, right, we've got time for a uh, couple more. We've got a question from Al Oster, who's a good up-and-coming trainer in Yorkshire. Um, what advice would you give to a professional trainer who's in the early days of his coaching career? Well, what I would do, I'd tell him to learn about nutrition and weight-making. Um, Um, I'd, I'd say you've got to learn how to do your own cuts. You know, okay, there's nothing wrong with getting a cut man in because a cut, a, a cut man it, it takes a lot of pressure off you, especially in big title fights and stuff like that. But if you're going to be if you're going to be a trainer and, and getting nutritionists and things and stuff like that, but if you're going to be a trainer and you want to be the real thing, you've got to learn about all of, all of these aspects of the sport. You know, you've got to you've got to be able to do everything. You know what I mean? You, not not just bringing in specialists and this all, all the time. You've got to be the real deal. I, I did my own cuts for years. Do you know what I mean? I knew about I knew about nutrition. Um, I knew about modern training methods. But I, 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 but okay, I brought a specialist in like Kerry Case because he knew more about nutrition than me. He was an expert. You know what I mean? But some of these fighters, some of these trainers today, they don't know anything about. You know, they just leave that, all that stuff to other people. When um, the trainer is the man in charge, not the nutritionist, not the strength coach, not the so-called conditioning coach. The trainer should be the conditioner, right? It's you. It's you should be the conditioner. Um, and you, and you, and you, if you're gonna call yourself a trainer, you're supposed to be able to do cuts. You know, so everything. And the last one today. Okay. Actually, we'll scrap that one. Let's go on to a different one. And it's from another up-and-coming trainer in Wrexham. And he says, must be something that's frustrating him. It's from Jay Yates. He says, what do you think about this current trend of prospects having two weeks in Ibiza and a month off after they've beaten a journeyman in a four-rounder? Well, it, it's kind of ridiculous. You know, uh, when you're a young, when you're a young up-and-coming fighter, you need to, be, unless, you're, unless you've been in wars, unless you've been in re, re, real wars, you should be kept busy. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? You should keep yourself in shape all the time. Um, so, you know, going and partying after I've, I've, having a full round of that, it's just uh, nonsense, do you know what I mean? You're starting from scratch again, aren't you, when you come back? 
Yeah, of course. I mean, you, look, you've got you've got to live the life. You've you've got to live the life because it makes it a lot an awful lot easier for yourself. So going out and celebrating after winning a four rounder and fucking off to Ibiza and getting pissed up all the time, it's just a load of bollocks. And you, and the fact of the matter is, if, it's a, if you've got a fighter who's like that at that stage of the game, he's not going to make it. So you're wasting your time. Well, there we go. Brilliant. That's for questions, Billy. Episode two done and dusted. Don't forget, sending questions for the next episode. There might be some prizes on offer as well from VIP, where the video version of this podcast is being broadcast. Uh, you're sending your questions to preacherspod at gmail.com. Get on Twitter, at preacherspod. Uh, leave your reviews, rate the podcast, and get subscribing to it. And we'll keep doing them, won't we, Billy? Yeah, absolutely. As long as the fans want me to do them, I'll do it. Brilliant, I hope you've enjoyed it. That's episode two done and dusted. For all boxing, info, news, and latest interviews, amateur and pro, across and off, click and subscribe. VIP, boxing promotions. Also, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook.